Good. All right, so I guess we'll get started. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to the secret of brewing up a good API. It's going to be a, uh, an overview of design API etiquette, um, things you should do, things you should keep in the back of your mind, and um, some more in informational pieces to that. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm currently the technical lead for cloud native development at Vulture. Um, this covers API v2, load balancers, our managed Kubernetes offering, um, and all of Vulture's open source. Um, so what makes a good API? There are a few things I would say, um, the first one being documentation, URI design, consistent types, pagination, informative errors. Um, and then authentication and rate limiting, I kind of package it up together as they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but we'll get started with documentation. Um, so I would argue that the most important thing of any API is the documentation. That is a source of truth. That is your binding contract between you and the developer. Um, it should be informative and clear. It should be concise. It should offer everything uh, the developer will need to do to, to integrate with your application. Um, it should return everything, regardless if the responses are good or bad. Um, and it should outline the behaviors of query parameters, authentication, um, headers. Anything and everything should be defined in the API that way, or in the documentation that way. There are no surprises with implementation. So this may, uh, may not look as clear and concise as you would want. Um, but if we kind of go over it, uh, you'll see that it is kind of clear as to what it does. We have a header that's a create coffee bean. The description kind of tells you what the, this API call does, the specific endpoint, which is coffee beans. The method, um, the request body with all the fields defined, whether they're required or they're optional, um, their types. And then we also have an example of a request and a response. So, this is a, is a good starting spot for an API. If we were to give this out to anyone you know, integrating with this, they could have a clear understanding that these are the this is what my request should look like, these are all the required fields if I want them, and an example response. Um, we could also enhance this out, of course, with adding you know, whether there's authentication, also listing um, any type of other responses, such as errors. Um, but overall, this gives you a pretty good idea as to what this specific endpoint um, would provide for you. Now, there are ways to make this documentation better, because um, this right here is pretty rough when you look at it. Um, there are a lot of tools around documentation, um, specifically the Open API spec, or OAS. Uh, it's a Linux Foundation collaborative project, and what it does is it, it lets you write your API spec in a specific way. That way, it's portable. Um, so there are a lot of tools uh, around this, such as Swagger, or Spotlight, but there are a lot of benefits to using these tools. Um, if you were to define your API to the OpenAI specification, you could then add it to tools such as Swagger or Redoc, and it will create generated HTML for you so you can clearly and cleanly make a nice templated uh, API API documentation. The other benefit of kind of following this documentation spec is that you can take this uh, specification and then in your said language when you're implementing, um, there are tools that will actually parse the application, the API spec in coordinates with what your application is doing um, and validate them on the fly. So in this example where you have your defined fields and whether they're required or not, when you're writing them to the open API spec, when you're using these tools to validate your requests and your responses with the spec, they will actually uh, be handled gracefully there. So I would say documentation is definitely the most important um, part of your API. And I would always recommend starting with, with your documentation as that is the source of truth, and if you start with your documentation, it gives you a lot of leeway into helping you design and think about other portions of your API, such as errors, whether you want pagination, and, and, and so on. Um, the next portion of this would be the URI design. So there are specific patterns you should do, but the best one to follow is that your URI, um, which are your endpoints, 
should be modeling a resource. So if, you, if we look back at the documentation uh, aspect of this, you'll see that we're modeling a coffee bean. Um, so you have ID, type, region, roast, limited, quantity. Um, in terms of your URI, it should always model a resource, not an action. Um, they shouldn't contain any verbs, and they shouldn't be plural unless they're singleton resources, which I'll cover in a bit. Um, also use dashes instead of underscores. These are kind of, these are kind of the behaviors that the JSON uh, spec follows in terms of API design. Um, so these are designs you should avoid, right? Create coffee bean, get coffee beans. There's no need for these verbs. Um, if you're looking at this URI design, it may take some getting used to if you've never worked with APIs, but the HTTP verb followed by the resource makes it really clear as to what you're doing with, with that said resource. Post whatever resource, in this case is coffee beans, it's always going to be a create, get coffee beans, it's going to return a list of coffee beans and so on. So when you're designing your, your URIs, you always want to model a resource. Um, that way, the resource and the HTTP verbs kind of give you a clear cut model of what your URI kind of does. Now, I mentioned that singleton resources usually aren't plural. Um, this is because they're usually get or update. They usually just have get or update calls on them. So in this case, if we look at coffee beans followed by ID, which would be the coffee bean ID that you get back from your list or your get calls, um, you can also get back a brew config or you can update a brew configuration. Um, and that kind of leads into consistent typing. Um, this may seem innocent at first to have some of your fields be mismatched, whether the quantity type on your request for creating a coffee bean is a string while you're returning an int. In most, um, this wouldn't really be affect you as the API designer, but as a developer, if you're working in a loosely typed language, you really won't feel the headaches of that. Um, but if you're working in a typed language, that's when things get a bit difficult because when you're trying to model these types, um, for example, the coffee bean, when you're making the request, you have your pre, you can predefine an object or a class, whatever you want. Um, but then on the, rec on the response, you're getting different fields and then it takes extra effort as the developer to kind of integrate, doesn't have any predictability. Um, so this is kind of going back to the example where with our request and our response, you'll see that the types match up and the responses match up. In my request to make a coffee bean, the types are strings, the, li the limited field is a Boolean and the quantity is an int. And in my response, it's the same thing um, with the addition of the ID field, but that is more of like a computed field that you're kind of getting back on your, uh, your, your response. So this may seem innocent at first when you're kind of implementing it where your fields are mismatched, um, but as an integrator, this can have greater consequences down the line and cause a lot of headache for the person integrating with your, with your API. Um, and the same thing can kind of be said for your top level nodes, which are your responses. When you're getting a coffee, when you get, when you get a coffee bean, you get a coffee bean resource followed by the fields. If you are getting a list of coffee beans, it's coffee beans followed by an array. Um, whatever the resource is, is usually what the top level node should return. So if we were getting the brew configuration, um, it would return back a brew config followed by whatever fields those are kind of defined. So the biggest thing with, with consistent typing is you want to make sure that your fields, whether requests or responses, are the same in terms of typing. And you also want your top level nodes to usually model whatever resource you're calling. You will see a lot of APIs usually just do data, which is also a valid way of doing it. Um, Maybe preference, I usually prefer having the resource defined there. That way, if I make a response, or if I make a request and my response is coffee bean, I can kind of get an idea of what call was made. The next thing would be pagination. Um, when you're starting out, whether it, this would be an internal API or a public-facing API, 
you're usually not going to have a lot of data, so pagination isn't something that comes to your mind. Um, but as your API grows and your data set grows, uh, the pagination can be beneficial because it can remove a lot of load from the API and improve um, response times, alleviate the API from heavy loads, um, and overall it's just a, a very good practice. So pagination gives you a lot in regards to performance and behavior. So this is an example of what you could expect in a pagination uh, request. So here, there are multiple types of ways to do pagination. I will cover them in the next few slides. But here, you'll see that um, we're defining a query param of page, per page one. What this is saying that on this list of coffee beans, re only return one coffee bean. Um, and then what you get back is you get an additional meta node. And that meta node will tell you exactly how many coffee beans there are in the list. And it also gives you a next and a previous um, ID. So if you wanted to iterate through these, these lists of coffee beans, you would basically do you know, coffee beans per page one. And you would, add, you would also add in the next field with that value. And that would let you kind of, that would get you the next coffee bean in the list. Um, so this is a cursor, cursor method. Um, and right now, we'll kind of go over the three main types of pagination you'll usually see in an API. So the first one is pages. Um, this is the simplest, most common way you'll see where all you're really doing is on your back end when you're getting your data, you're more or less breaking up your data sets into pages. Um, so you'll see that page one, page two, page three, and all that really is mapping to is just a limit on your database, whether you're saying, you know, get me everything between 1 and 20, 21 and 40. Um, there are pros and cons to this, um, but this is the more or less the easiest way to kind of get started with, with an API or API pagination. The next one is going to be a key set. Um, this one is different than the, the pages one. What this does is there's an additional um, field in your data set that acts as a delimiter. Um, so in this case, it's called since ID. So when you're creating all of these coffee beans in your, in your back end, each one of them has a specific ID. What you're doing with your pagination is you are defining that you know, return all products from ID 1 to ID 20, ID 21 to 40. Um, so you define a specific delimiter in your list data, and that would return data accordingly. The next one is the one that we saw prior, and usually the one um, I like using, um, but it is a bit more complex to do, which is the cursor method. It acts as a pointer within your data set. Um, so like in the example I showed, you have your said data set and you get back a pointer to whatever your list is. And that cursor gets transformed in your backend to a specific uh, SQL configuration that gets appended to all of your calls. Um, this is nice. The pros to this one are you usually don't lose any data. If new data gets added into your data set, um, there is a chance with pages or a key set, you won't get that data returned depending on where it falls um, in the data set. With a cursor, usually the data is um, descending or ascending by a specific field, usually a date. Um, and that kind of gives you the flexibil flexibility to set this data in a way that every time you want to, you add new data to your, your set, you don't really lose your spot since the pointer is always updated. Um, if you have 50 items in your list and then you add an additional 100, the cursors usually aren't a set value um, in your list, while something like a key set will be because it's based off your ID. Um, so that, that's pretty much it with cursors. Um, moving next. So informative errors. Same with, with, consistent, with the consistent types uh, and the documentation. This is one that usually gets neglected. Um, 
with any error you have in your API, you should try to document it and be transparent with those with those errors as they are valid fields uh, within your API. So they should be informative to the issue. You should treat them as regular responses. Um, they should be returned with top level, top level nodes, usually with errors or whatever you kind of want to define there. Um, make sure you use proper HTTP codes. And another thing you may want to do is map, mappable error codes. Um, and we'll get into that. So, Here's a good example of, you have your error, you have your status code, you have a message, you have an error code, um, and then you have a resource. So with this response, if you were to get this response, you can kind of have an idea of what happened, where it happened, um, and you can kind of integrate with this in a way that would give you the flexibility to execute your application accordingly to either do a retry or to handle this failure in a specific way. Now, you might be wondering why have a message of unable to authorize with the status code of 401 and then have an error code of you know, ER underscore auth. Um, the benefit to the error code is that your message could change unintentionally, intentionally, um, but it's not really a constant. So if you're integrating with an API, and you are specifically looking for failures and you're keying off the message, one, it's a pretty large string, could be long, could be longer. So it's not really a good identifier as to what happened. Um, while an error code is usually something consistent, it's usually something defined in your documentation. There's usually a list of what they might be. Um, for example, like these, where we have you know, an ER, ER auth and it's a 401 with a response. Um, you know, user provided auth failed or a error body. These things give you an easier way and more clarity to integrate with, with errors. Um, one good example of what API does this would be Twitter. Um, Twitter API has a lot of, they define all of these informative errors, these error codes, and it just makes implementation and integration a lot easier. Um, like I said, if there's any issues with it, you can kind of key off these as their constants while the message may change on you. Um, and going back to the documentation aspect of this, in the example I showed of the documentation, we didn't define um, all of the error codes, but you will want to define that. If your documentation is transparent and has more, more information than anything else, it gives, it, it's going to remove the headache for the developer integrating with your application. Well, and also to note on that, it doesn't matter if it's a internal API or a public API. More so on a public API as it's a public API, you know, people are gonna be integrating with it. The more information, the better it will be for them to kind of get started. An internal API, that's usually when, you know, it's an internal API, you know the team that's integrating with it, you kind of want, you, you can kind of get lazy um, with it, but I would urge, urge you to do that extra work as it is a contract and it is it provides a binding contract between you and that said team. Um, it also makes it a lot easier for them to kind of just integrate with your documentation and go from there without asking you a thousand questions. Um, so the next thing um, and kind of the final portion of this is the authentication and rate limiting. Um, I bound these two together because they usually go hand in hand depending on what type of strategy you go with. Um, so the first thing is authentication is not the same as authorization, right? Um, authentication just provides a way for you to validate that person's said identity while authorization would then see if this account actually has access to execute, you know, creating coffee beans or listing coffee beans. Um, they go hand in hand here. Um, usually on an API, you'll see read, write, or read and write on resources, and that's where authorization kind of comes into play. Now, in terms of authentication, you the more common one that I'm sure everyone has seen is an API key. That's usually an OAuth type of setup or a unique key. Um, a lesser known one, you don't really see it, but maybe if it's an internal type of application, username and password. Um, this, 
There's a lot to consider here when you're kind of going with the authentication route. If you're going with something like OAuth, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of moving pieces within OAuth, but you do get a lot out of it. Um, a unique key is more or less a unique API key that you generate for your API, and then you kind of distribute them. Um, with the OAuth key and the unique key, you usually have ACLs that are corresponding with those specific keys, with those specific behaviors. Um, which then you have ACLs and you go from there. With the basic auth, think Apache or Nginx username and password that you kind of set as, uh, as headers. Um, and that brings us to rate limiting, right? Um, rate limiting, this is extremely important, both of these for public APIs, internal APIs. Again, you can maybe get by by not using it, but it's better to have it when, it's better to have it and then kind of hate yourself when you don't. So with rate limiting, this allows you to define how many requests can be sent within a specific time frame for all users or a specific user. If you're doing something such as a unique key per user, you'll usually have a corresponding rate limiter that would limit all calls coming in. Think Nginx sort of blocking the requests if a specific IP or a specific key gets ping too many times. Um, in an OAuth flow, you'll usually see that they all have more or less a very large limit of like 5,000 requests per hour, something like that. But with the rate limiting, it helps you prevent DOS, malicious or accidental abuse of the API. And it also does help prevent quality of service and uptime. Same way pagination, where you're kind of limiting how much data you're sending back. In this case, you're limiting how much data can be kind of requested at a given time. Um, and like I said, there are multiple ways to do this, whether on a web server, um, where you kind of define this on Nginx or Apache, where you're setting a rate limit set there per IP, per key, or software-based implementations such as OAuth um, or a unique key. Um, and here's some useful links. Um, the pagination information that I kind of pulled down from, those are just high level aspects uh, of the pagination. Um, but this is a very good medium link. Uh, if you want to kind of learn more, I would recommend checking out that specific post. Um, the JSON API spec, the jsonapi.org, if you want to get more granular detail about how your API JSON should look, um, I mentioned a lot of things and I heavily and take from a lot of the JSON spec, um, your top level nodes, how your errors should be kind of modeled. There's a lot of different ways to do a lot of these. Um, more or less the APIs follow them, but I would recommend checking out the JSON API org to kind of get your own feel for them. Um, same thing with the API spec and the API initiative. Um, both of those will really help you create a stellar documentation that can be portable and reusable that gives uh, the integrators uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of implementation. So the key takeaways here for good API design, uh, if there's anything you take away from this, I would, <laughs> I would say it would be documentation. Um, documentation is the source of the truth. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Um, if, you're, if you start with API documentation first and kind of keep that in the back of your mind, always updating it, using it as your design, your initial design document, it will lead to a lot of edge cases you may not find in terms of just plain old implementation. Um, and that's pretty much it. I don't know if anyone has any questions uh, about anything here, um, anything we talked about, or if there's anything you kind of want me to dig into a bit more. Yeah. So it seems like pagination in general would be kind of racy, like because the data set might change while somebody is slowly paging through. So are there some strategies to avoid that? Right. So the question was, in terms of pagination, you can run into a case where data is being inserted by one specific API call while uh, you're inserting data and I'm kind of pulling data out, right? So you usually will see that with um, the page based. There are the, so the strategy you go with pagination will kind of define whether or not you run into that. That's why I like the cursor method. The cursor method will always kind of, depends how you implement it, 
but in in my experiences, we kind of you always def you always set your set list data to be newest data that you just entered to be on the bottom of the list. That way, when you're iterating over it, you'll always kind of you'll never run into that race condition. Um, but the other ones, yes, you will run into that. Um, so it's just a matter of how, which one you choose, because there are pros and cons, but that is quite a big con, and that's why I would usually recommend the cursor method. Um, but yeah, it, that's something to consider when you're looking at them, because you can definitely run into uh, race conditions with that, definitely. Does anyone have any other questions? So yeah, there are ways to, so the question is, you want to encrypt your data kind of in between calls. And if you make a request, the back end will encrypt that data, I'll send it back to you, and only you know how to unencrypt it, right? There are strategies to that. Um, one that I've used is usually an HMAC uh, method. So it's just HMAC. Um, and that usually works where there's a lot of moving pieces to that, and it is a bit more complex to implement, but it takes a lot of things into consideration. So you know how to generate a key, and I know how to generate a key. So we both know how to generate our specific signing and unsigning key. Um, but when generating the HMAC, there are a couple things we look at. We look at the headers, we look at the times, we take a lot of the information of our request, and we use that to encrypt our specific data. That way, you get this data, and it, there's only a time span of like five minutes that you can kind of mess around with it. Once that time expires, even though I know how I have my signing keys, I can't even unsign it. Um, so there are some methods, uh, HMAC. Um, there, are, there are other ways to kind of implement JWTs with an HMAC. So you'll see JWTs kind of being thrown around, around, around a lot now. They're kind of popular. Um, but they don't offer any encryption. It's just base64 encoding. So if you want full encryption, I would recommend looking into HMAC um, for your APIs. Yep. Any questions? I would say if you're looking at public APIs, you'll see it's usually OAuth. It's an OAuth 2 type of implementation style. So the way they do it, usually in an OAuth flow, there's a lot of you have a token, you have to refresh it every so often. When you're looking at these public APIs, they usually handle that refreshing for you. Um, Whenever you see an API and it usually has, you'll, you'll see a pattern and you kind of get a feel that they're using this flow. It usually has read, write um, type of values out of the box. Um, and you can also set an expiration date on these tokens. So for example, the GitHub API gives you a lot of this flexibility where you can kind of per resource define your ACLs whether you want read or write. And then you can also define, you know, after X time this token's invalid, after an hour, after a day, or it never expires. Um, so I would say an OAuth authentication is usually the most common um, and probably the one you, you would want to go with. Um, you will see others such as like just custom solutions like unique tokens, or which are just API keys, but that's more of like a homegrown solution. You kind of have to still implement your own ACLs per resources. Um, so it's just a matter of do you want to go with OAuth, which is like a standard, or do you want to go with something homegrown that kind of offers the same thing? Yeah. So the question is, do all pagination methods kind of give you the same performance across the board? Um, I don't know 100%. Um, I would say there might be extra compute in something like um, the cursor method, 
because you're kind of you're doing extra steps while like the key set and the pages one they're kind of like they're just limits on your your SQL calls right or specific delimiters while the cursor method kind of adds a bit more to it you kind of have to take that cursor transmutate it to whatever the SQL is and kind of append it but at the at the core it's it they're all doing the same thing where they're just you're manipulating how that data in the SQL gets comp you know computed um, I can't I if there is a difference I would say it's it's minimal um, the one thing to consider is with, with the cursor method you are at a you are returning like a whole data node but that should be minimal in terms of like the entire compute so I, I would say I don't know the, the answer off the top of my head, but I can't imagine that there would be a drastic difference between them. Hopefully that helps. Does anyone have any other questions before we wrap up? Yeah. And then the client did not follow up on that request. So it's holding on this kind of temporary data or temporary view. And there is another client for a new request, so it may have another view, another view. So like if the client is expected to have one or more calls to get all the data from the server side, like how it managed to hold in this data, all these results is if that makes sense. Because the, the call is not complete, like the partial I called one twice. I have more data. The server knows exactly what it is. I'm holding mm -hmm. it, but I want, I'm not going to make the call table, for example. It's an so the question is, how would you handle the, the back end when there are these, there's a set of three calls that you need to make to kind of get the full data set, right? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, kind of stumped on that one. So usually when you're creating, for example, the coffee beans, when you create a coffee bean, right, you're not going to have the full data set immediately. Um, or for any resource. Usually, most of the time you might, but there are a lot of instances where you won't have that full data set. Um, reason being is, you know, the ID hasn't been generated, or let's say you're kind of deploying, you know, servers. When you deploy a server, you, you're not going to have the full data set immediately because an IP hasn't been issued, we, you know, the Mac hasn't been kind of established. Um, so you get a, a partial response back, but eventually the server will kind of finish that process. Um, and then if you make a get or a list, you'll have that full data set. But that initial call, you won't. So to kind of further your point where you need to make these follow-up calls to continue the full data set. Um, that would really fall onto how you kind of implement and design your back end, right? The, the API is more or less just a, a doorway to kind of your back end structure. So if your data is kind of reliant on the three calls, that, that would really have to fall on how you kind of, wh whether you put them in a temporary data store or you just, there's a, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, So with your specific case, if I, there are three API calls and I never make the third, the data would just be stagnant, I guess, right? Like, I never make the call. So what, like, the way you would have to do it is kind of by piecemeal. The data has to exist in the database or some, some data store. Um, and if you don't make that third call, you just won't have the full data set. There's, there's really not much to go about there. Um, Yeah, it, it would have to, you would have to really consider how you're designing this. The way I would probably go about it is maybe you have a temporary data store such as like Redis where, you know, incomplete data sits there and you're always making calls against that until it's complete and then you move it into a more permanent data store. That's one way to go about it, right? Um, but that really falls more onto how you do the back end. In terms of the API, you could just leave the API as is but always make some validation check to see if this, it, does this data exist in my temporary store? If it does, it's incomplete. 
If it doesn't, you can kind of go about whatever that workflow is. So a lot of moving pieces there, but I would say that would be more of a technical design on your back end structure than anything. You're welcome. Anyone else have any other questions? Guess not. All right. Um, I guess if no one has any other questions, um, the slides are on online. I did post them. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to ask me in person or ping me uh, on Twitter or um, reach out on LinkedIn. I'll be glad to kind of kick these around a bit more if you have any other questions or anything more technical or in-depth that you would want to share. Um, other than that, thank you all for coming and thanks for the questions. <laughs>